Welcome to this special Choices and Challenges Forum. The Choices and Challenges series at Virginia Tech explores the human questions, the ethical, social, legal, and political concerns that result from advances in science, medicine, and technology. For more than a decade, the Choices and Challenges programs have considered a wide variety of topics ranging from breakthroughs in the biological sciences that can change the features of a single microscopic cell to advances in physics and engineering that can alter the way we function in our universe. All these advances in science and technology have given us new choices in the way we live our personal lives and conduct our lives as citizens, and all have presented us with new ethical and social challenges. But none of these topics touches each and every one of us as directly as does the topic of today's program, the nature of the food that we eat. Advances in genetic science now make it possible to move genes from one type of organism into another. Scientists can move genes from daffodils into rice, or take genes from bacteria and put them into corn and soybeans, or introduce rat genes into lettuce, or put genes from cows into pigs. The purpose of all this genetic manipulation is to produce plants and animals with new and useful properties, more resistance to diseases in the field, longer shelf life in the store, more nutritional value on the dinner plate. And these new food choices present us with some difficult issues. At the forum, the audience came armed with their questions. These questions guided the discussions of our panel of experts. Robert Buchanan of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Gary Comstock, founder of Iowa State University's Bioethics Institute. Harvey Glick, director of the Global Product Stewardship Group at Monsanto. Gregory Jaffe of the Center for Science in the Public Interest, a Washington-based consumer interest group. Arthur Liang, a physician at U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Food Safety Office and Stephen Yearly, a sociologist from York University in the United Kingdom. Our moderator is Mark Sagoff of the Institute for Philosophy and Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Let's join Mark as he starts off the panel discussion by looking at the quite different public reactions to genetically modified foods in the U.S. and in Europe. Some of us have foreign backgrounds. Uh, Gary, as you heard, comes from Iowa. And I think we'll just begin with you because you've been on the farm and know something about the concerns there. Well, I'd like to introduce uh, the issue of the difference between American attitudes toward genetically modified foods and European attitudes toward genetically modified foods. I hope Stephen Yearly will have something to say about <laughs> that. But uh, the issue is a real one in Iowa where genetically modified foods begin because farmers like my uncle are uh, right now actually starting to break ground. It's not quite warm enough yet to uh, put the seeds in the ground yet, but it soon will be. And farmers have to decide whether to plant genetically modified seeds or uh, traditional seeds. Last year about this time, my uncle Harold Pippert and his son Jason Pippert, who were fourth and fifth generation farmers, uh, decided to plant genetically modified seeds. I asked them about that, and my uncle uh, replied rather sheepishly because he knew that I published about a half dozen articles in the late 80s and early 90s that were very critical of genetically modified seeds. And he sort of said, yeah, uh, we decided to plant Roundup Ready corn this year. About a month later, he called me and said, you know, uh, have you read the papers? And I said, no. And he said, uh, you know, the Europeans aren't sure that they're going to buy Roundup Ready corn. And the reason is that the elevators here in Iowa market a lot of their corn to Europe. It goes down the Mississippi to them. And the Europeans are not wanting GM corn. So the elevators are saying, well, we're going to have to segregate your corn if it's Roundup Ready as opposed to traditional. And we can't do that. So here he is in a business where the margins are very small. He doesn't have deep pockets so he can pull up all of his GM corn seed and put traditional corn seed back in the ground, this was a real problem for him. Why is this, uh, Steve? What, what, what is going on in Europe? Well, I th think there are two kinds of things going on here. I mean, I, I think the first thing is that when initially there, there wasn't a great deal of public concern about GM crops, 
uh, but many of the environmental campaign organizations were preparing themselves uh, to think about what were going to be the consequences, particularly the environmental consequences of this. But then, w just around the time that uh, most of the uh, imports were likely to be coming in, was in the immediate aftermath of the mad cow problems. And, of course, from a, a, as it were, a straightforward, naive consumer point of view, the experience of mad cow disease was that uh, for years and years, the government had been giving reassurance based on the best expert advice that this stuff was completely safe to eat, that there was no conceivable risk uh, of human uh, health problems re resulting from this. Uh, and then suddenly, it, the government changes its mind and announces that there are health risks all along. Um, and of course, from a consumer point of view, the reassurances that were being given about GM food looked identical. I mean, that, that we have all these experts, they've tested it, it's safe, there's no conceivable uh, possibility of harm. And that was, of course, those became very scary words because they were the words that were used immediately before it was announced that you could get mad cow disease from eating cows. How did the supermarkets respond to this? Well, I, I mean, I think that the thing there is that obviously, as in the United States, we buy a great deal of our food through supermarkets. And the supermarkets began to compete with each other uh, to eliminate GM foods from the, uh, the, the things that they sold. So most of our supermarkets have their own line of you know, TV dinners and their own line of cereals and so on. So this was the thing which they could start off by controlling. And they said, well, we're going to Im eliminate GM uh, food from these. And then they would compete with the other supermarkets by saying, you know, we care more for our consumers because we listen to them and you don't want to go to Tesco's or the Sainsbury's because they have this dangerous uh, GM stuff. I'm concerned about serving this genetically modified food to our children, our family. Is it different from the food we've traditionally eaten? Who's regulating this technology in the U.S.? Who's looking out for the health of our family? Uh, Greg, what's going on in the United States? And can you uh, elaborate on this? What's the difference? Well, I mean, I think I agree with Steve that there are differences between the European consumer and the U.S. consumer, and I agree that Europe has a history of a number of uh, food safety concerns and food safety scares in the last decade, and so they are much more skeptical about what's being put in their food. And I think the other thing is that they're also skeptical about, about their regulatory agencies. Uh, because of that, um, they don't have the same openness and transparency that some of our regulatory systems have. And so uh, consumers are very skeptical about what the government says about food. Well, in the United States, I think that's different. Yeah, but Bob Buchanan might want to speak to that. That's How good. is it regulated? Why do we trust you guys so much? Um, I think it, it stems from the fact that inherently the United States citizen is not trustful of government. And that's forced us to have policies and practices that are transparent, open to the world to see. And as a result of that, we've built up the confidence by making good, sound, scientific decisions about issues, safety issues, such as uh, genetically modified corn. I might add, though, although I think that the U.S. consumers uh, and the U.S. public does have trust in our regulatory agencies, for, in this case, for biotech foods, those foods aren't approved by the F Food and Drug Administration here before they are marketed. I don't think a lot of consumers know that, but I think when they know that, they're going to become a lot more skeptical about those foods. Uh, that's incorrect. What there is is that a determination in the early 90s that the existing regulations were more than sufficient to, to regulate these products. Since that time, we've also been petitioned, and we do have a proposed uh, mandatory notification process for uh, foods derived from biotechnology. You are correct, Bob, that um, the FDA decided in the early 90s that they used existing regulations and maybe the best thing to do is to explain what that means and what that means is that um, the companies, the biotechnology industry can come in voluntarily and consult with FDA about why they think the food is safe and it's their determination that the food is safe, not the FDA doesn't say we agree with that determination, doesn't say we approve the food, um, that can be marketed and, and the FDA does have authority if that food is adulterated or there's a problem with it to get it off the market. But uh, the biotechnology company uh, can put it on the market without going to FDA, without an approval process. And there are approval processes in, in other countries, Canada and Europe and so forth, for these foods. So what I was saying was that there wasn't, not that there's not regulatory authority in place to address 
concerns that might come up in the food supply, but that there's no pre-market approval authority out there for these biotech foods. You know, it's the liability system in the United States that is the chief uh, doorway to protecting food. Anybody who puts a, a, a food that's dangerous out on the market bets his company. And uh, there are thousands or millions of contingency fee lawyers asking, are you injured? On the, and if you can prove that you've got an, I mean, any company that isn't aware that they're liable for the damage they do, this is what scares them. Not so much regulation. This has nothing to do particularly with food. It's consumer products generally. The major concern among corporations is with liability. Uh, regulation helps, but liability is always there as a backup. I'd like to know whether these foods are safe. Safe for us to eat, safe for the environment. Well, as I understand it, the uh, regulatory agencies here don't see biotech as a process uh, problematic because it's fairly close to the mutation, genetic mutations that we've seen in food uh, historically. The uh, tomatoes that we eat bear very little resemblance to whatever it was in the nightshade a century ago that was discovered that could be made into a tomato. The, um, the corn that we eat it looks entirely different from the small specimens that grew in nature and so on. So we are familiar, uh, aren't we, Harvey, with a lot of biotechnology already. And my impression is that uh, foods are all regulated in the same way so that the uh, agencies don't distinguish between uh, those that have had uh, uh, one kind of genetic engineering rather than another. What we call conventional food that has been developed through traditional plant breeding, cross breeding, back crossing. Most people aren't familiar with the processes that have been going on for a hundred years, but they generally involve forcing a mutation to get a change in the hope that one of those changes will be desirable. To make those mutations or changes in conventional foods, they use techniques like chemicals to induce mutations, radiation, um, nuclear energy, trying to force the plant to change and hoping one of those changes will be beneficial. Um, it's a rather imprecise technique, but that's what we've been using for the last hundred years. The new process is to try and take the same concept, finding a change in the plant that we can make a better product from, but do it in a much more precise way that doesn't involve mutation and radiation, but involves genetic engineering. But they are regulated very rigorously and uh, no different than the foods on the market today. Uh, uh, Gary, I, I noticed that a lot of um, crops like canola wouldn't have existed without a great deal of mutation. Uh, and a, a, um, a biotechnology prior to, um, uh, to the current uh, kinds of genetic engineering. Do you think that there's a difference that's worth noting between what we are able to do today and uh, the kinds of technologies that have radically alter altered plants in the past? Right, well, uh, Harvey's point is that the current techniques are sort of a are continuous with the traditional yeah. breeding techniques of the past. I think that's right to a large, large extent. But the public generally perceives this as a radical break, and I think it's worth acknowledging mm -hmm. what it is that's right about uh, many people's view that this is a radical break. I mean, even though it's true that canola and even wheat, as well as corn, bear almost no relationship to the indigenous varieties that we had several hundred years ago as a result of conventional breeding, it's also the case that biotechnology gives us powerful new tools. So we could not take a, a phosphorescent gene and put it into tobacco using conventional breeding. We couldn't take uh, an antifreeze gene from a fish and put it into a strawberry using conventional techniques. We couldn't cross pigs and humans. And we have taken the gene for human growth hormone and successfully inserted it into the germline of hogs. So it's a little dissembling to say there's nothing new under the sun here. Biotechnology is completely of a piece with conventional techniques. Uh, there, is, there is something different the, about the, this. The crosses are much wider. Right, and I would agree with, with Gary. I mean, you are putting a gene from a different species into a, a, another different species, in this case a bacterial gene, into a corn plant. And I think that does raise food safety concerns. There are concerns of allergenicity. There are concerns of toxicity. And I think the combination of, of the potential concerns that we have, and some of those are science-based, plus the public's perception of this, does require some, 
some additional regulation by the government. Um, we do regulate food additives. We do regulate certain kinds of things um, and require approval of those before they're marketed. There are other foods and conventional foods we don't. I see two concerns here. One is just the a kind of moral concern or, or even spiritual or religious concern about crossing species boundaries that many people think are, are sacred and important and, and certainly genetic engineering is able to do that. And then there's this, the other issue of uh, whether this translates into food safety concerns rather than broader spiritual concerns. I'm going to ask Art Lang uh, to talk to us a little bit from the point of view of the CDC about food safety and where biotech fits into some of the really important problems that we have in, in, in understanding the, the safety of our foods. Um, I'll come out immediately and say, in terms of uh, the, our food safety radar screen, actually GMOs are probably conspicuous by their absence. Uh, we have done a little bit of work recently with FDA and EPA, and I can, we can talk about that. But uh, in terms of our food safety radar screen, we're, we're pretty much, well, we, we monitor human health, you know, actually human illness. So, that, so we're usually, we're monitoring sort of well-recognized food safety uh, problems, concerns. So traditionally, our, our the government role in, uh, in looking after infectious diseases and contamination of the food supply. Uh, another, another part of CDC looks at uh, pesticides and environmental health mm -hmm. uh, concerns. And then uh, maybe uh, last but not least, part, there's a part of CDC that uh, I'm not sure this is traditional food safety, but in terms of food and health, is interested in the issues of you know, obesity and hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Now, is there any reports of anybody getting sick from a biotech plant, uh, food? Well, my, my, I have to say that in, term, I, I'm, in this sense, I'm a, a bit of a, uh, I'll speak as a layperson, because actually CDC doesn't have any active monitoring systems mm -hmm. uh, for allergies in general, which is one of the concerns, mm -hmm. or for uh, GMOs, uh, illness due to GMOs in particular. But, so having said that, I will say that uh, we, don't, we, we have no knowledge of any uh, of incidents of human illness that have been clearly linked to, to GMOs. Uh, the, 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 our most recent experience, perhaps our only true experience, was uh, a joint investigation with FDA uh, related to the Starlink concerns. Mm -hmm. And that turned out not to, not to, there was illness, but it was not linked to the corn. In, in a way, as far as I understand it, um, the uh, uh, two great uh, reasons to use biotechnology on the farm is to make uh, the crops uh, resistant to um, uh, insects and also resistant to herbicides. If you make a crop resistant to herbicide, you're going to use more herbicide, Roundup in the case of Roundup-ready crops. So that might suggest, uh, Harvey, that we're selling more herbicide and putting more um, of this uh, on the land. And this would be bad for the environment if it gets into the lakes and rivers and so forth. How does it affect wildlife? On the other hand, if you're spraying less pesticide, if it's in the plant, that does would, would seem to sort of control it and keep it spread down in the natural world. Although I've heard things about uh, pollen uh, escaping that contains this. What do we have to say about that? Well, there's two specific cases. Uh, the first one is the crops that have natural insect protection in them, the so-called BT crops. Um, it depends on the crop and on the market, but in some cases, the conventional variety of that product would require 8 to 10 to 12 insecticide sprays during one given season to control some of these insects that would just totally decimate the crop without protection. These new BT biotech varieties reduce those 8, 10, or 12 insecticide sprays to maybe 1, 2, or 3, depending on the pressure in the season. So that's a direct reduction. Every time you eliminate those insecticide sprays, you're also not harming some of those secondary and tertiary insects that live in those plants. And so you're seeing more of these non-targeted organisms surviving and thriving. Whenever you see more of those non-target insects in the field, guess what they attract? They attract the pheasant and the quail and the wild turkey who feed on those. So you're beginning to see a movement back to some of this wildlife returning to these fields because there's less insecticide spray. What about the herbicide? So on the herbicide side, you're making a plant resistant to a specific type of herbicide. That allows that product to be used in place of the herbicides they would use in the conventional variety. In many cases, they were older products that were used at much higher use rates. So you can now use a product 
on the herbicide tolerant crops at perhaps a lower use rate, or perhaps that herbicide has more favorable environmental properties such as it doesn't move into groundwater, it doesn't persist in the soil. So there are a lot of benefits to the herbicide tolerant crops as well as the insect tolerant Well, people crops. worry, of course, that nature will uh, respond and we will have lots of, in, of resistance to Bt and insects and eventually we will lose this very important um, uh, 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 weapon against, uh, against insect pests. People worry about the genes getting loose and the production of super weeds. Uh, I, I imagine that your organization has been concerned about this. I mean, I think those are two important issues. I think, you know, in, for the current crops that are out there, there aren't so many food safety concerns, but there are definitely environmental concerns. Some of those are being uh, are attempted to be addressed by the industry. Some of them are being addressed better than others. I think you're correct that if farmers keep planting Bt corn and Bt cotton, that uh, insects will eventually have resistance to those. And the Bt, uh, Bt, the pesticide, the protein that's being used as the pesticide there has been used by organic farmers for, for decades to help them farm. And if we lose it, uh, if the resistance occurs, it will occur not just for the genetically engineered crop, but potentially also for the organic crop. And so EPA has attempted in its, re in its registration of these plants to ensure that farmers plant refuges so that there's a place so that we won't get resistance to those insects. But the industry, both the biotechnology industry um, and also the farmers, aren't complying with those at 100% rate. And the scientists tell us that you know, all you need is you know, in insect resistance to occur in one place, and then it starts to uh, cascade down, and then you have insect resistance. So I think there's not, being enough, uh, not enough being done by the industry, the farmers, and the government to ensure that we protect this, uh, this benefit. Is this all just another example of a technological treadmill that will leave us no better off despite all the hype and publicity? One of the criticisms you hear all the time that biotechnology is just another uh, link in the technological treadmill, a technology the early adopters get into it, they underprice the later adopters and buy them out, driving down prices, and as a result there are fewer f and fewer farmers. and. Farming looks more and more like any other industry. Harvey, is this just inevitable? Is this just what technology does? Or is there anything special about biotechnology in this respect? I think there's a lot that's special. And I think sometimes we overlook uh, the farmer's perspective. Um, I've been fortunate to have lived and worked in a number of different countries and continents and, and seen agricultural production in many different parts of the world. And it's been really gratifying to talk to growers who have had the opportunity to plant some of these new biotech varieties whether they be to provide better insect control or to provide herbicide tolerance. What we have found is that, first and foremost, growers tell us it makes it easier to farm and produce food. And anyone who comes from a farm background knows that it's very difficult to produce food. There are a number of pests and insects, you're fighting weather. It's a very difficult job and one that's very critical to our planet. So anything that makes that job easier is a real benefit. Secondly, we've heard farmers tell us that they've been able to significantly reduce the number of pesticide inputs they use in growing those crops. They like that because one, it makes their costs lower, but secondly, most farmers I know are very good stewards of their land, and they want to use pesticides as judiciously as possible. And if they can use them in a way with these new biotech crops that reduces the volume, they like that. That also translates to a number of downstream benefits. If you use less of these pesticides in the environment, there's less of them that are going to run off with rain and so on into surface and groundwater. So there are a lot of benefits from these crops. And the other thing that most people often overlook is that it's not just the large soybean farmer in Iowa who is getting tremendous benefits. If you look at some of the smallholder farmers in parts of Africa, um, uh, the Makatini Flat region where they're growing some of these BT cotton varieties on one acre of land. And when you see the tremendous increases in yield they get, and they actually have some additional surplus income, and they can produce a little bit more food, you see that these benefits apply not just to the large industrial farmers of Western Europe and North America, but they apply equally well to some of the very small and resource poor landholders in many of the developing parts of the world. Greg, is this just a technological treadmill where yields go up and numbers of farmers go down? 
Uh, I mean, I, I agree with Harvey that there are some farmer benefits to the current crops that are out there. There are some environmental benefits. Um, I think it moves us slightly down the continuum. The best would be organic or sustainable agriculture. Current agricultural conventional agriculture practices are very harmful to the environment. It moves us one step uh, closer to the organic sustainable by reducing some of these pesticides, and to that extent, there's a benefit. But I think, coming back to your earlier question, I don't think there's a consumer benefit. The consumer, only to the extent that the consumer cares about the environment, there's a benefit, but the consumer doesn't. Um, although there may be a farmers may get increased yields, they may get some uh, increased income. Uh, the food in the store is not cheaper for the consumer. There's no nutritional benefit added to the consumer. There's no better taste added to the consumer. And to the extent that there is some risk uh, borne by the consumer, um, they don't get any benefit for that. And I think that one of the keys to public acceptance of this technology is getting products out there that have some consumer benefit. Uh, and until that happens, I think there will be a question. What will be the effect of these genetic technologies on one of America's most cherished institutions, the family farm? My uncle plants uh, Roundup Ready corn and soybeans because it means that he has to handle fewer chemicals, which to him and his son is a real benefit. Uh, insecticides in particular are not fun to handle. Um, so there's, and he has to make fewer trips across the field because the crop he's planting is protected against the things he used to have to spray often for, so he saves fuel costs as well. Those are immediate benefits to him. That's why he plants it. But, but he says to me, look around the county. How many farms do you see? And that's where all this theoretical apparatus about the, te the technological treadmill becomes real for me, because we have a farm crisis that Willie Nelson is not singing about, and the New York Times is not writing about this time. In the mid-80s, all that stuff went on, but we have more farmers leaving the land now in Iowa than we've ever had. And the reason is that the industry is becoming rationalized. Uh, as all these technologies make corn and soybeans cheaper to grow, farms have to get larger because the margin that they're selling for is smaller and smaller. Now that's the long-range problem, and that seems to me the moral question we need to ask ourselves. Are we happy having our Iowa become like California, where we would only have, instead of several hundred thousand family farmers, a handful of farms owned by industry? Are we happy shipping our farming to other countries and not having right. any farms we've seen in this, this country? Uh, with pigs, and we've seen this with chickens. I think now three companies, uh, uh, Tyson's, Holly Farms, and Purdue produce almost all of the chickens in the United States, and those who work, uh, they work for those corporations in, in, in producing them. But this is true of the automobile manufacturers, and it's true of television and computer manufacturers. We see many of them going out of business, and the business is contracting to a few. Harvey Gleck, is this something we just have to put up with as the rationality of efficient uh, production, or uh, do we owe something to the smaller farmer to keep him in business in spite of these uh, rationalities or efficiencies? Well, I'm probably the wrong, I'm not an <laughs> economist or an ag policymaker, okay. so, um, but I think one element to this discussion is important is that many people have a notion of what the American family farm looks like. And most times it's a very nostalgic image um, which is far from the reality of farming today. And I think if Gary described his uncle's farm, it would sound a lot more modern than our picture of the traditional American family farm. Um, but I think there is a real problem, um, not related to biotech, but related to agricultural policy. And I think there's a lot of work that's being done in the current farm bill to try and address some of these concerns. But you're right, it is a real issue. Bob, and we'll hear about your I think that it's important when you're talking about the technology treadmill um, and, the, and the issues to, that biotechnology sometimes gets caught up in a bigger issue. And I think Harvey's right. I mean, um, what's happening to farming in the, in the United States has been happening well before biotech crops came on the agenda five years ago. And if we got rid of biotech crops tomorrow, that still would be happening with the consolidation of the farms in Iowa and other places. So I think that there are bigger issues, bigger policy issues, bigger societal issues to decide how you want to uh, address farming in this country, and I think sometimes the biotechnology debate gets caught up in that. But I think that, you know, although it may continue on the technology treadmill, to the extent that we are going to continue that as a society, there are some environmental benefits, and, and we should, we should uh, be able to uh, 
as a society make use of those benefits while we're staying on that treadmill. We may choose to get off that treadmill, but I think you have to separate those two issues. I'm concerned about the impact of these genetically modified food plants and animals on people in other countries, particularly those living in developing countries. Will this technology make their lives better, or are they going to be worse off? Uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of product re replacement now. If, if uh, uh, developer of growers or any growers could put uh, uh, cocoa or coffee into lentils or something like that, what would happen to the major exports from the developing world? It's like any dynamic system, as I was referring to. Uh, for example, let's look at the other side of the, the, the coin and through both biotechnologically derived plants and also by normal breeding processes, we've been able to introduce a whole variety of fresh produce manufacture in South America to replace the growing of coca. Uh, a, a, a concern, of course, that we have in the United States, but was a major agricultural ca cash crop in that, those regions. And by making varieties of plants that normally would only have grown in the temperate zone available for production in those areas, we've introduced a, 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 an alternative. We've given the third world countries a, a greater uh, diversity or toolbox that they can use, and, and I think helped ourselves in the, the, the same process. It's, it's important to think carefully about how we think about this, too. I, I don't think Bob intended this, but when he says, we gave the third world this and we gave them right. that, he, he doesn't mean that, <laughs> that uh, we sort of control how the world operates. And uh, I think what he means is that we uh, make technologies available to anyone through the intellectual property system that we have to protect inventive uh, creativity. But then that's available to anyone that has the initiative to try to develop it. So there's, there's paternalism with regard to develop the developing world and paternalism. We can be paternalistic by sort of shoving tractors and high yielding varieties and so on down people's throats during the Green Revolution. But it would also be paternalistic for us to withhold technologies and say, you can't have these because these uh, might put your crops out of business. I, I think it's equally problematic both ways. So you let the market speak, isn't that, 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 the, the, in, in China, small farmers are buying a lot of your Roundup Ready crops, uh, aren't they? Is this, should we just say, let the individual farmer decide and, uh, uh, and, ha and help subsistence farmers where we can? I think, I think it's important to bring it back to some very simple um, assumptions. Most of the developing world tries to produce food in a climate that is much more difficult than here in North America. It's generally warmer, there's much more pressure from insect pests and from weeds, and generally water is in less supply. So right off the bat, they are, they've got one hand tied behind their back and trying to reach food security and self-sufficiency in food production. So they are looking for, today, short-term answers to help them produce more sweet potato on their one acre of land, or more cassava. And our industry is not naive enough to think that we're going to solve the problems of world hunger, but we do think that we can make a small contribution to these smallholders who said, give me some tools because the seeds I plant today don't yield enough, the insects eat them. I don't have any tools to protect them. If we can solve some of those problems, that's one small step to improving productivity in smallholder and developing markets. Now, there are many, many other issues associated that have to be addressed, but our focus has been we have some technology, and the beauty of the technology is it does not require a new tractor like the Green Revolution. It doesn't require irrigation pumps. It requires a seed that's got a little bit of technology in it. And every smallholder farm around the world knows how to plant seeds. He doesn't need any different technology, a different planting system. So we think this is a, a small approach to helping improve, at a very practical farm level, increase food production. But we know there are many, many other issues that have to be addressed from a policy issue. Greg's going to help us with that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's important when you talk about developing countries and access to this technology that those countries have the right to make a choice, their own choice, and not have uh, an international debate or Euro Europe or U.S. sort of tell them what they should be doing, that they should have their choice to decide if they want to adopt this technology and use it. That is easier said than done. And I think there's a combination of making the technology accessible in terms of intellectual property rights, but there's also the fact that, we, that the developed world does control this technology. 
all the science that's going on in the technology is occurring primarily in the developed world. That's where the infrastructure is. <clears throat> that's where the research laboratories are. That's where the money is. And I think that it's important uh, from a developed country perspective that we provide um, the uh, infrastructure and the um, access to the technology and train scientists and stuff so that these countries can make a determination whether this technology will help them or won't help them. I think in the end they're going to make a different risk-benefit analysis than a developed country or a European country might make because they don't have all that food in the supermarket to choose among. Their farmers are, are at a very different stage. So I think so. But I also think there are different risks involved. I mean, if you grow soybeans in the United States, we don't really have to worry. It's not a, the origin. Uh, soybeans didn't uh, come from, from the United States. I believe they came from China. So if you grow a Jenkins United soybean, you may have a different risk issue in China or corn in Mexico. And so there are different risks. So we can't also say that the risks are the same. Each country needs to assess those themselves. I understand that genetically modified organisms are owned through our system of patents by private companies. Perhaps the panel can comment on the tension between private ownership and the public good when it comes to our food. So, and in the third world, are people concerned with the um, developing world with, with patent issues that somehow they won't be able to plant their cassava, or if they do, they probably will, they'll be in, um, in defiance of a patent? The, there have been concerns about the issue of biopiracy has been raised, and it really started before biotech came around. It was a lot of um, people from the pharmaceutical industry and from the cosmetics industry were going around to tropical countries and trying to extract plants that would provide an ingredient for a makeup base or for a pharmaceutical product. And that created some concerns of local countries that, well, why don't we take that resource and make that cosmetic or pharmaceutical in our own country? Um, and that terminology has got extended to biotechnology. I think what's important is um, if you look at what's going on in many parts of the developing world, um, industries are cooperating, pu public and private sectors are cooperating to work around patents. And a good case is the uh, recent uh, golden rice uh, issue that was developed by a university scientist in Switzerland, uh, Dr. Ingo Patrikas. Um, and he developed a variety of rice that had enhanced <coughs> levels of vitamin A, which he thought would be a great idea because a lot of the developed world doesn't get enough vitamin A and it leads to illnesses. The problem was there was no fewer than 70 patents that prevented him from taking his discovery of this new high vitamin A rice and giving it to growers in the developing world to plant. He said, I can't do that because I'd be infringing on all these patents held by universities and companies. And, but very quickly, at least for this type of project, all the parties got together and resolved all those patent issues, and that is now moving forward as a product that will be available to many of those countries. Well, H Harvey mentioned sort of the big problems here, which is an anti-commons uh, that is set up. Now, in a commons, nobody owns the property, so everybody gets it before the other guy can, and so it's wasted. And in anti-commons, there are so many fences set up so much of the genome is owned by different parties that you have to have a tremendous collective action uh, uh, problem in order to get all the permissions you need. One could really distinguish here between those companies that own bits of the genome, not because they have engineered them, not because of any inventive step, and what's worse, the information that contains them. There's a question of, I own this part of the genome, therefore you're using this information to make the, the rice. You can't use that information about nature. I discovered that information about nature, and therefore I own it. A lot of people have trouble with how far these gene patterns are reaching with respect to the information they contain, and whether uh, you can always go through the exercise of bringing 70 patent holders together even a company like Monsanto, if it wants to uh, come up with a new product. Or one thing yeah. Greg said about the golden rice case. Uh, the golden rice case is instructive because it is a nice example of industry working together with government and so on to make technologies available to developing countries. But we can also ask whether it's uh, an exception to the rule. And uh, Harvey was right that all these issues got worked out fairly quickly. But although I think, according to Ingo Petrikas, it took yeah. Uh, six to 12 months, 18 months, something like that anyway. So you can ask yourself whether that's quickly or not. But the underlying issue is, would it have happened had Ingo Petrikas not appeared on the cover of Time magazine and in the side, 
inside story complaining that there's all these problems with intellectual property, so he can't get his product out. Now, if I'm uh, at a company that holds one of those patents, I'm asking myself, is it going to be good business for us to be in this position, or would it be better business to just give it to him and come out a winner, which is what happened. But it doesn't address the issue of the whole system okay. of the pro property rights. On some products, the presence of any genetically modified food ingredients is mentioned right on the label. Wouldn't this be a good way to reassure consumers and allow them to choose for themselves what it is that they put into their bodies? We should turn to the issue of, uh, of what it would mean to label these foods. If, uh, and the problem here is that, uh, and this was brought up by our representatives to that conference, uh, if you consider uh, soy oil as an ingredient in food and it's in everything, and the soil oil mixes around from oil that is from genetically engineered plants, and it's all the same oil, uh, how do you determine what is genetically engineered or not? What do the labels mean? And how can you figure out how or what to label? Should this be a matter for uh, the organic and other farmers who can segregate their crop and say, this is GM free, and you just assume everything else has it? Or is there some other way to approach the labeling issue? We've done some consumer surveys about labeling issues, and I think what we find is uh, the average American doesn't really know where his food comes, he or she, where their food comes from. Um, they don't know a lot about modern conventional agricultural practices. And so if you ask them, do they want genetically engineered uh, foods labeled, they say yes. And you say, do you want pesticides labeled? They say yes. Do you want cross-bred corn labeled? They say yes. Um, you know, they, 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 <laughs> consumers, you know, ask, of course, nobody's going to say no to not wanting more information. The question is, is it useful information, and how do you provide useful information? Uh, we did a focus groups where we put labels, mock labels on, with genetic, saying this was genetically modified or had genetic engineered organisms in it, and most consumers didn't know what those meant. So I think before you can have a useful label discussion, you really also need to uh, have, at the same time, an education uh, discussion, because information without education to understand that information really isn't useful information. Um, and from a food safety point of view, I don't think that anybody's arguing, that, or most people aren't arguing you need this on the label because they're worried that this food isn't safe. If the food isn't safe to eat, it shouldn't go into food. It shouldn't be allowed on the market. So we shouldn't say, oh, well, it might not be safe, so we'll let people put it on the label and let them make the decision. <laughs> I think we want to have FDA or or regulatory agencies, other people saying, if it's not safe, it shouldn't be out there. If there's any question of its safety, it shouldn't be in foods. So then the label, in this case, becomes a, an information, a, a right to choose uh, for environmental, other issues, but not for food safety. Uh, this is just a picky technical point, but uh, uh, I, I think the issue, uh, from, from my perspective, the issue of um, allergen label is a, is a good one because um, allergies are sort of idiosyncratic. That is, most people can eat them safely. And, and I add that GMOs have not been linked to allergies. But, but uh, I didn't want to give anybody the feeling that uh, peanuts are on the label because uh, uh, they're unsafe and that they take peanuts out of the marketplace. Well, people <laughs> should have the option of opting out of buying genetically modified food. And uh, there should be some way to do that, perhaps by just buying organic food, or there may be providers who, as in, in Europe, uh, provide that. It will be a cost issue, though, because the price of segregating <laughs> the food through the food system and making sure that uh, it's not contaminated, if, to use that word, which of course, or, or, or mixed, uh, can be quite high. Despite all the good intentions, I think that we may be going too far too far in interfering in nature, too far in playing God. I wonder what the panel thinks about setting some limits. A lot of people think that you can't own nature as intellectual, or that our whole relationship with nature is changing because of biotechnology. These people might look at the genome as somehow exceptional or somehow essential to what we are or what uh, species are, and now we're crossing species lines, uh, really from flounder genes into, into uh, plants and so on to tomatoes. W well, uh, and we find out that we ourselves are very close relatives of yeasts, perhaps more <laughs> some yeasts than other yeasts, and perhaps some of us more <laughs> relatives to yeast than others, but uh, we, we find out that we have fewer genes than some worms. I mean, <laughs> Darwin is finally coming home we find that, uh, that the, the genome is sort of one, and it, it has lots of changing varieties. We're changing those varieties. 
artificial selection change them, natural selection. Where does humanity fit into this picture of nature? Where does nature fit into this picture of nature? Is it just one big Lego kit now that we can, <laughs> we can build what we want? In which case, what is there that we can respect and love and admire for its own sake? What is there left to wonder about? I'm putting mind, uh, there's this um, a German sociologist, Ulrich Beck, who's become you know, um, kind of very popular in these kind of uh, policy circles in, in the European discussion about this. And you know, he's, his kind of argument is that, in a way, the, the fears that we have at the moment are really fears about the humanization of nature. I mean, that the previously, our fears about nature were about nature being uncontrollable. And you know, that we may not be able to control the climate, you may have a hideous drought, there may be unexpected diseases. But now, in a way, the, the, the concern has flipped over through a period of optimism, where we thought we were getting the hang of all these things and we could work our way out. And now that we realize that the new fear is the thing to be afraid of is that the people who control nature, I mean, so that we've been so, as it were, so successful in this uh, understanding of nature, that we now realize that, that our safety with respect to smallpox, for example, or other dread diseases, isn't so much with regard to outbreaks of the disease, but the security of the places in which the smallpox is held. Our concern about uh, food security isn't down so much to vagaries of the weather as to, well, how much can we control the regulatory agent, I mean, how much can we trust the regulatory agencies that say whether these things are safe for us or not? So I think, I mean, it's partly um, the, the kind of, um, you know, I guess, spiritual kind of thing that you're, well, you're, you're saying. God is, is, yeah. is, is but, the problem, and but it, but, but, we but don't it, want that. I would no. rather have God play God. Yeah. No, but, but also, it, it, it's, it's, it's again your question of who is the we are. I mean, because, I mean, part of the concern, I think, is that, well, there's someone playing God, but, but it's not me. It's some, you know, it's some company or it's some uh, re regulatory agency. And, I mean, I think that that, in, in a way, is at the heart of these anxieties. Mark, I, I think they're going well beyond where our real estate of knowledge is. And let's, let's use your Lego example. And we're learning a whole lot about the individual Lego blocks. We know whether they're red or they're blue or they're white. But now that's all we've got. We know a knowledge about the blocks. If you watch five, you put five five-year-olds in a room and you give them a pile of Legos, what are the odds that they're going to come out with this, the same thing that they build? It's how we put those pieces together where the mystery is still. The, the, the genetic code just starts us. We know extremely little. And we find the more we learn about the genome, the more we realize we don't know how it's expressed, how it's regulated, uh, how it, it works in different settings. And what's more, how important it is. There are all kinds of other aspects of development environmental aspects and random aspects that are plainly as or more important. So we're learning to think of the genome as perhaps less important, uh, less central than I, we I might have thought. No problem waking up ever, every morning and being an absolute wonder of the world around me still, even though we know a lot more than when I was five years old. Gary, before we go to questions, how would your, your uncle on the farm think about uh, biotechnology and what it's doing to his view of the, a farm, the farmer, and the farmer's relation to the, na to the nature that, that he, he depends on? Um, well, I can tell you what, what he thinks. He, he doesn't know. And to hear Bob talk about the Lego kid and we really don't know how to use it very well reminds me of my uncle's comment because my son cannot take Legos and make a headless mouse. But in 1995, researchers at the University of Texas did just that. I mean, it's not the case that we've got just the rudimentary knowledge of all this stuff and we can't really do anything really dramatic with it. We can make mice fetuses without heads. We've done it. We can put human genes into hogs. We've done it. We can probably put hog genes, genes into humans if Congress will let us. So the story about my uncle that I'm reminded of uh, is late last summer we were walking through his uh, rows of genetically modified corn and soybeans and uh, he knew that I have sort of doubts about all these sort of philosophical issues. Uh, and he sort of turned to me at one point. Uh, the sun was going down. You can get your handkerchief out here, Mark, if you want. <laughs> and he said, are we doing the right thing? And here's a man standing on ground that was virgin prairie until his great-great-grandfather plowed it in 1868. 
And he's thinking about his son coming into the business now and just wondering, are we doing the right thing? He knew about headless mice. He knows about putting human genes into hogs. And he's thinking, it's not just that we've got Lego pieces scattered all over. We are doing things that we have no idea how to assess morally. Uh, uh, we all know that one billion of us, the human family, live in abject poverty. 750 million of us are hungry, without food, dying on a planet where an excess of food is being produced. An excess of food is being produced. There's plenty of food to go around. This is the, the food fright. Why do we have so much malnutrition and hunger in a world in which agricultural markets are glutted? And why don't people have the money or the access they need to all the food we now produce, much less all the food we can produce? Um, well, no, I mean, I, 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 I think that's exactly right. And, but in a way that, that um, that goes to the heart of a lot of things that we've been uh, talking about, which is that many of these our considerations are kind of driven by uh, a, a technology and what we, you know, what a company would like to see put out or what um, what innovations can be introduced. And in a way, we're not standing back and answering the the broader, more holistic question about well, what are the kind of policy objectives that we want to achieve overall? So I mean, even. Uh, closer to home. I mean, there's a consideration about, you know, um, well, wh what are the health problems of the American population that are associated with uh, food issues? And they're mostly to do with obesity uh, and unbalanced diets and so on. So, so that a lot of the things that we're talking about here, which are, you know, looking at ways of boosting production, yeah. aren't meeting the, the, the kind of problems even domestically, let alone. That's, that's true. Uh, the chief causes of, of malnutrition and hunger in the world are not the availability of food worldwide, but gender inequality, um, destitution, civil war, religious conflict, the prevention of people from having their normal civil rights, bad, ridiculously bad government, failure to have property rights, no access to markets. In short, uh, the, the horsemen of the uh, apocalypse ride together. And so where you have disease and war and civil strife uh, and tyranny and injustice, there too you have hunger. I don't think that uh, biotechnology can address those issues unless it tries to change the human soul. But that's the great difference. We try to use technology, but in fact it's our own morality and our own sense of responsibility on which we must ultimately re rely. I want to thank the audience very much. We invite you to learn more about this topic and our other topics at our website, www.cddc.vt.edu slash choices. Choices and Challenges forums are a production of the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies at Virginia Tech.